I mean, I've been fired before. I've been laid off before and I've quit on my own before. It's a lot better to quit on your own. OK, but I have seen the door slam in my face many times. I've maxed out credit cards. I've been worried how I'm going to pay for Christmas with things with kids. And and I've been on the other side of this. But I always kind of had this belief that things will work out if you treat people the right way. And I, it's not lost on me when I was broke 10 years ago um, how lucky I am right now. All right, Phil, take it away. We've got uh, our really good friend, Ryan Dietrich, who probably has a great origin story of stock twits with Phil and I. We've got uh, JC, who hasn't showered. Otherwise, he'd be flaunting single gelled hair. Um, but I like I like the look. JC, I like this look. I like this look. Are you in Beach a hotel? JC, Strasser says Beach JC's way. He likes J- Beach JC better than regular JC. I, I don't know. It's nice here. It's I good, like right? JC. The sun. Think about it. The sun, the sand, the ocean water. Like our kids do a lot of like magic stuff and princesses and all that stuff, right? Like kid stuff. There's always magic. The beach and the ocean is as magic as it gets in real life. Roman, isn't that right? It's so nice. That's five it's milligrams. A lovely thing. Five milligrams, boys. All right. right. No. I have it's been lovely. in uh, the beach. Is great. I have- Gentlemen, this is a treat. Um, we've got Ryan Dietrich, who uh, he's, been, he's become a bit of a whore <laughs> on CNBC, but we don't hold that against yeah. him because the guy's got to make yeah. a buck. He's, what do you mean uh, he's a whore? For CNBC. You when you're sexy, you can pull that yeah. off. This is a friendly it's, show. This is a friendly when you, show. When you have ears like this, Howard, everybody likes you. What, what can I say? Yeah. Listen, the nicest guy that's ever come out of Kentucky. Are you from Kentucky? <laughs> no. Ohio, it's all the same thing, though. Yeah, whatever. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, it's close. Still, it's close. Yeah. Still the nicest guy that ever came out of Kentucky. And Phil Perman is wearing uh, his uh, – he saved his T-shirts, Ryan, from his kids when mm-hmm. they were eight. Yep. And because he's in good shape, he pulls them out and flexes them occasionally. He took them – we have skinny jeans. Phil has skinny T-shirts. You, 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 He's wearing one just, today. You, by the way, just Phil. Be jealous. By the way, a little jelly. By the way, Phil. Last Let's, fucking week, uh-huh. Pop was wearing a tie. Yeah. And your fucking shirt was inside and out. Your shirt. <laughs> yeah. You were wearing your T-shirt. Inside. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't really what? care. You looked homeless. You looked homeless. All right. It's so good to have Ryan on the show. I pinged him last minute. This is an interesting market. I have very little to say, so I wanted Ryan to come on. Phil, take it away. Ryan Dietrich, uh, Chief Market Strategist at Carson, an old dear friend to uh, all of us here. Um, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing well. Uh, yeah, Howard hit me, hit me up on uh, X yesterday, right before I was on uh, CNBC, and said, you want to come on? I said, Twitter. 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 It's fucking okay, Twitter. Twitter. Right. Okay, we'll call it Twitter then. I love so. how you call it X, Jesus. Dietrich. I love how you do that. <laughs> yeah, you know. I can't. I still yeah. call it Facebook. Uh, well, yeah, it's meta. Yeah. Alphabet. Who calls it Alphabet? Yeah. Alphabet. Yeah. Alphabet. Yeah. Yeah. But we pull them out of the it, streets. It, it is 618, it's 618 day, right? So I live in the 513 Cincinnati, but there's some Fibonacci numbers here in this T-shirt I'm wearing. I thought JC would uh, appreciate that with the 513. Oh, they're all Fibonacci mm-hmm. numbers. I see you, you know, dog. See I that? see you. See that? It's a dual thing there. But, Hold but back. Yeah. Your question, what's more important, June the 18th or November the 23rd? Uh, well, I'd say November 23rd because it's probably close to Thanksgiving and everybody gets to eat a little more food, I guess. That's the only reason I'm saying that. But yeah, that one. <laughs> I always think They're both about, great think in their own way. Yeah. Both great in their own way. Okay. Do I need to step in? Are we talking about stocks? Do I need to step in, Phil? <laughs> so I just want to start here. I just want to start here. And I just want to give you a shout, bro, because I remember in Q4 of 2022, we're all looking into the abyss. Everybody hates everything. The world is ending. And you're out there bullish on stocks. And I just want to give you a shout out, bro. And just take a victory lap for us because we all love you and you deserve it. Well, thanks. Yeah, that that wasn't uh, the most popular call. Um, But, you know, honestly, listening to you guys and listening to some of the stuff JC was saying, you know, where you had more new lows in June and not as many new lows in October. And then just the seasonality stuff that we look at, it's perfectly normal to have a major low in October. If you don't have a recession, I work with a guy named Sonu Varghese. Who's, a I, midterm year, by the way. Exactly. Midterm year October. I work with Sonu Varghese. So I know hopefully a lot of people know by now he's been on with JC before. He looks at the macro stuff. He was saying, listen, there's no recession coming. Slow down, sure, but no recession. So 
The average bear market without a recession is 24.5%. We had a 25% bear market into October 22. And we just saw reasons to think it'd go higher. And then just real simplistic things, right? Keep it simple, stupid. I, I kind of live by that motto. I'm from Kentucky, according to Howard. I am Ohio. But nonetheless, you know, pre-election years usually are pretty strong, okay? I mean, <laughs> we know we knew that. And you start laying it into a lot of stuff. But but we, we were one of the few places that were optimistic last year. Um, people hated it. For a big chunk of, I'd go on TV and just get yelled at for being bullish, a big chunk of last year. Uh, we've been overweight equity. So I work at an RIA that manages about $36 billion, give or take, uh, or t- total AUM. My team manages several billion dollars. So when I'm on TV, I'm not just um, a talking head. I'm talking about what the Carson Investment Research Team has to say about the world, right? So um, we've been overweight equity since December of 22. We are still overweight equities right now. We can get into some of the weeds of that. Uh, we just still think that stocks are pretty good place to be and it's been a nice ride but we don't think it's over yet ryan um at the carson group for what you do for your um how you help advisors make decisions what are what are the alternatives like like so for example you're talking about being overweight equities let's say you were underweight well then Mm -hmm. what are you in bonds are you in gold are you in bitcoin Mm -hmm. uh etf like how do you think about the other stuff? Uh, great question there, because let's be honest, I work at an RIA. So are we ever going to go 100% gold? Probably not. I think it's pretty safe to say there. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> I mean, we, we know the lo- we know the longer term trends tend to be stocks do pretty well. And that's what we're trying to help your average investor understand, because over time, that compounding really works. But JC, to answer your question, yes, we actually added a 3% allocation to gold in some of our tactical models. Uh, let's see, is March of last year. So March of 23. We actually have been very underweight bonds for a while, especially duration, the two years I've been there. But just about two months ago, we actually added some uh, treasuries for the first time in forever. We get into some of the inflation views and some of the reasons we think yields are going to go a little lower. We actually added some duration to bonds, but we're still underweight bonds relative to the stocks. Uh, we got a little bit of cash, a little bit of gold in there. And, um, you know, still we're sticking with some of the cyclicals, which I know have struggled lately. I mean, get into that. Um, but we're still optimistic with no recession coming. That's going to be the place to be. But yeah, JC, we're, I don't want to say vanilla necessarily because we, we can do some more unique things. But, you know, when we manage several billion dollars for clients, we just try to um, make sure that they understand, you know, the path is <laughs> stocks tend to do a little bit better. And when you don't have a recession, like we've been saying for a while, stocks are probably going to do even better. So that's why we've been tilting um, equities over bonds um, in the models we run. What, kind of, allocation, what mm-hmm. kind of allocation would you consider underweight, mm-hmm. right? So you're overweight equity. Yeah. So what kind of allocation percentage well, does that? Let's just stick with, I guess, you know, 60 40. I mean, that's probably the easiest way. We, we, we manage about 16 different different types of models. So I'll keep this fairly simple for the listeners. But 60 40, I mean, we, we'd be 5% underweight, maybe say 55% equities, about 45% bonds, or maybe 45% other stuff, maybe bonds, gold, some cash in there. Would we ever swing, you know, more than 10% away? Honestly, some of the, I'm get in the weeds of some of this, but some of the rules we have, we, we're not even allowed to do that, right? I and mean, we're supposed to stick with kind of the, the guidelines and the ranges that we have. But again, we can, we can tilt pretty good. I mean, I work for a guy named Bert White. I worked with Bert over at LPL. Bert is now our CEO. And one of the things Bert told us two years ago, told Sonu and myself, some members of the team, is listen, if you're confident on something, take a pretty big swing, right? We're a fairly new investment team. We're doing some new things. We're growing like like mad here at uh, Carson Group. And we took some pretty big swings. And we run unconstrained models, meaning you can go 100% equities if you want, right? And we don't necessarily do that, but we've been pushing 80, 90% equities in those unconstrained models for a couple of years. I mean, our models have greatly outperformed you know, that, our benchmarks. That, Go ahead, but- Phil. Is that is that for all your customers over ninety years old? Or well, if they wanted to invest in that, they could. Although I doubt if they will. That's up to the advisor, right? With whatever the advisor, we work with advisors, and advisors can pick but where to put their I, clients. So yeah, I, I I know I know the Carson Group. I know where you worked at yep. LPL. I think for young people watching, because the four of us all met <laughs> on stock stock twits. Tell people how you get into this career because you've had a rocket ship. You know, tell people the struggle. Tell people, you know, your passion of stocks and how you end up here being able to make decisions like this over, you know, two billion, soon to be 10 billion. And, you know, Carson Group, who I'm familiar with and talk to all the time, um, where this all goes for people that are listening on StockTwits 
Um, tell them. Yeah, so I worked at a small, I'll try to make this the quick version. I got the bug in the, yeah, in the late 1990s in college. My dad gave me some play money, quickly made money, lost it all because there, there was a crash, right? I didn't know what was going on. I used leverage. I didn't know. I didn't know anything, but you'll learn. You haven't learned. And I realized, oh, wow, I could have made money on the way down. That's kind of interesting. And I was hooked. I knew that's what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. I worked at a research shop in Cincinnati for about 10 years, give or take. Newsletter, that's where I got my analytical mind. Didn't manage money, but I wanted to work more with people. I love presenting. I love talking. I love communicating. So I want to become like a market strategist or work somewhere. I worked on an RIA for like six months after I left that place and they got bought out by Huntington Bank. So I was out of a job and I was really struggling. Um, you know, I was looking for different jobs and things. And and and, and this is where, you know, <laughs> I guess put, put a little more. And I started using um, Twitter, as we call it, Twitter back like in 2009. We didn't manage money. People forget this. You couldn't really get on Twitter if you if you manage money for a long time. So I had a first mover. Advantage. Right. There was no compliance. Right. And no right. And now everybody's on Twitter slash X. I want to call it. But that was the advantage I had. But then obviously we always had our first Phil moment. And I remember mine, Phil reached out and said, Hey, we're doing this thing called, you know, stock Twitch. You should start using this. And I started using it and started learning. And, and I just was hooked with the way you could communicate and the impact you could have. And then there was a point in my career where I had literally no money because I was looking for a job and I was in trouble. I didn't know what to do with my life. And, and Howard, you hooked me up and I'll just do, I know sometimes, you know, I'll just, I'll just say it like it is. You hooked me up. You flew me out to Stocktoberfest um, on your dime or somebody's dime because I didn't pay anything. Uh, got me out there. And, and I'll always, always appreciate this because I went out there, networked, and met people. And I met a top 50 LPL advisor. And he knew me. And one thing led to another. He connected me with Burt White, who was a head guy at LPL at the time. And after an interview, I'm hired at LPL now to be their, I guess I was started as a senior market strategist, eventually promoted the chief market strategist. After about six, seven years at LPL, working with advisors, had a blast, made a ton of friends. LPL was big, it is big. I mean, they're huge, like 22,000 advisors when I was there, over a trillion dollars. It was, it, was, it was to the point where for my career, a lot of layers, a lot of things. You couldn't really get stuff done because it was a big company. Uh, that's fine. So I was ready for something new. And Bert actually left LPL to go to Carson Group, an RIA. And we got to talk and he's like, you can make a lot more impact in the RIA channel than a big uh, broker dealer. I said, okay. And it all kind of worked out that I started with Carson Group about two years ago as their chief market strategist. I will say this, I'm loving working where I am, uh, doing what I'm doing. But maybe one more thing, because I think it's what you want me to point out, Howard. I mean, I've been fired before i've been laid off before and i've quit on my own before it's a lot better to quit on your own okay but i have seen the door slam in my face many times i've maxed out credit cards i've been worried how i'm going to pay for christmas with things with kids and and i've been on the other side of this so when people reach out and i see things i try to always say and believe me people hate hearing this but one door closes, another door opens. It is true, everybody, because I, I was that person. I wanted to punch anyone in the face that told me that because when the door closed on you a couple times, it's not very fun. Um, but but I always kind of had this belief that things will work out if you treat people the right way. And I don't know if it's naive or not, um, but I've always tried to live that way, tried to treat people the right way. I'm sure I haven't always done it. But, um, you know, I, I think that's just kind of how I live. And I just love waking up every day looking at the market, seeing what's going on, seeing what you guys are saying out there, listening to people, working with Sonu on our team and some other people on our team that are amazing, amazing people that care about nothing more than helping our industry, helping our Carson partners and helping their clients. And there's more we can talk about, it, but that's kind of what I want to do the rest of my life is wake up and talk about this stuff. And I'm doing it. And I, it's not lost on me when I was broke 10 years ago, um, how lucky I am right now. Just a quick plug, Stocktoberfest is in effect this yeah, year. So true. if you are yeah. and the people who are going to be there, there's going to be the big pros there. There's this going to be, be a panel. Mm -hmm. This could be a panel. This could be a panel. And mm -hmm. and so we're having Stocktoberfest this year, October 20 to 22nd. Just Google Stocktoberfest or go to StockTwits. And um, if you're in that situation- yeah, Phil, most importantly, if you're in that situation, I'm not doing free. <laughs> Sorry. So yeah, I just told him, how many people I just told it's free, Howard? Sorry about that. Yeah. You tell me a good – yours wasn't a sob story. Here's the thing. We're very – Phil, JC, and I are very passionate towards people that are making the effort. What 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 stood out about JC – you know, I hooked up Josh mm -hmm. and Barry at the first yep. Oktoberfest. who are now running $4 billion. Uh, Josh introduced us to uh, JC – um, Phil and I met on Fred Wilson's blog. I think the pay it forward part is you can only pay it forward to people that are trying to be in the business. And if you're not, if you're passionate about the markets like Ryan is or, or JC, if you're not writing, 
you're slamming a door in your own face, right? So, so the only way we would have discovered you is if it, you know, is you were sharing ideas or, or sharing, you know, and you don't have to be right. I think young people need to remember that if they do like the markets, if you're staring at a screen all day, it pays to take notes. And if you're going to take notes, take digital notes, share, doesn't matter who's following you. But eventually people are going to look back at those notes, not the, not your Zoom interview. So anyways, that's where I wanted to get to the story. There's never been easier to share stock with Twitter, Beehive, wherever you choose. Right. But be consistent, uh, be friendly. Um and you will never, I think, I think the, the network effects will do their things and you do get better from writing down about the markets. I, I mean, the stuff you share is great. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank so we'll get into the markets for these. So we two. have a lot of mixed signals going on here, <laughs> right? We have, we have different things going on and there's no two better people than Ryan and, and JC to sort some of this out. So I lined up a series of topics and charts that you could look at in different ways, right? That, that sort of go up against it. So the place where I'd like to start is just the popularity of momentum, right? Momentum and, and, and Bar Chart uh, posted this the other day. Momentum trading is having the most success in history, even surpassing the dot-com bubble. So maybe Ryan, can you just tell us what we're looking at here and maybe your take on it? And then JC, we're gonna come at you. Yeah, I mean, well, hopefully it's fairly self-explanatory. It's it's the stocks that tend to trend have really been trending upwards. And we know right now who it is, right? It's a mag, some of the big tech names, but large cap tech and things that are doing well that are trending. Uh, your MTUM is one of the momentum ETFs that we actually use at Carson Group, and we 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 have that. Um, but but nonetheless, when you think about it, it it's um <laughs> This is called trends with friends, right? I mean, I have a CMT. I don't have a CFA. I have a CMT, Charter Market Technician. Learned a long time ago that these trends can be in place a lot longer than you expect. And 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 again, it's uh, is it bubblicious here? I, I don't know. I mean, you, you could look at those pictures we're sharing there and, and think maybe a little bit, but breaking out to new highs is new highs. So it's, um, it's an area that I think many, many people have kind of touched that stove one too many times thinking that something's going to revert, not just momentum, just in general, some of these large trends and, and they they're still in play and it, it's an area that we're more even weight technology we are overweight communication services though so by no means are we underweight technology i wish we were overweight trust me um but but nonetheless it hadn't really hurt us uh, how we look at the world but but again it's um when you manage money it's hard to just say let's go overweight tech tech's like 28 percent of the s p maybe it's even more because it keeps going up so you know once you have that much to go much more overweight can be a little a little troublesome uh, to, to potentially, but again, we're a little more overweight communication services when you look at some of those high high uh, growth momentum names. I mean, JC, what are you saying? Well, I think what Ryan uh, started out saying is that, you know, stocks that are trending uh, higher are, are leading the markets and it's more just a, a function of the way the market behaves, right? We know momentum exists. We know that markets are not random, right? Like that was like a, a hypothesis that was, proven to be incorrect, right? Um, markets trend, asset prices trend. I'd be a little bit careful with some of these momentum ETFs because the way that they, you know, reweight and the indexes are always changing. So it's hard to compare today's momentum to, you know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. You know, I think that's getting a little too cute. I think it gets back to, you know, what, what uh, Ryan was saying before, how, you know, momentum begets momentum right like that asset price is trend like we know that like and, and that's happening so it's perfectly normal right it's confusing to me because this is what i do right and it's you know now that i'm 60 i'm looking at this going hey i feel like larry david it's like you have this style everybody makes fun of it and because it's aggressive it to, you know and then hold on know, i want to say one more thing somebody, sorry howard those charts really yeah. speak to that because it's yeah. not so much momentum as it is the components in that momentum ETF are, you know what I'm saying? Like, is it, mo is it really that momentum is doing so well or is it that the stocks that are in that are? Good point. It's just one chart. But what I would like to say is, you know, I've, I've joked that fundamental investing has never been less important, right? Because Floki's breaking out with NVIDIA, right? Like there's a chart that we shared last week that or a couple of weeks ago, and I don't know where the, the tokens can go into a bear market 
six times a month. But, um, you know, you, you look at a chart of Floki versus a chart of NVIDIA. NVIDIA, you know, plotted against its cash flow. Yeah, maybe overvalued, but it makes total sense that it's going up in a, in a historical framework of how you would value a stock, okay, and momentum. And then there's Floki, which has zero fundamentals. Chart looks exactly the same. So, so we live in this this world where I like to say that valuation uh, um, um, fundamental analysis means little than ever, and people jump at that and go, "But Howard," and I'm saying, "Listen, Tiger, uh, Andreessen, Insight, um, uh, what's his name, the crazy Japanese guy, Masa, they were applying these same principles to illiquid." assets but three years ago and history will look back on that era as probably being more crazy than 1999 because at least there was liquidity in 1990 sure it dried up very quickly and stocks fell 90 percent but there was no room once you were in the tiger private unicorn companies to get out there was just no exit these were just straight ass markdowns at the port that and i think that's part of why we're seeing momentum accelerate in the public markets is people are realizing, yeah, we may be stupid, but we're not as stupid as Tiger and and uh, SoftBank and, you know, Excel. Then 2021, we're writing billion dollar checks in the companies with no revenue. Right. So I think there's still there's just so much. Ca- You'll probably get to the next chart, Phil, that talks about the cash, but we've never been in an era where there's so much cash. There's so much information available to everybody, and there's so little fundamental analysis. And trend following just has always made sense, right? Things that are in motion tend to stay in motion. So, and and then the fourth thing about those charts is, you know, predicting when they end is almost impossible. Meaning it's it's easier to come up with uh, reasons why it can't continue, but I don't know. The trend is your friend. All right, next up. So Phil. Qu- regarding that. Perfect segue. What, and this is what I was thinking before you said that nobody knows when it's going to end. Ryan and also JC, what makes you, what would make you theoretically underweight or bearish here uh, if it's not? And I agree. My take here on this on this chart, the S&P 500 momentum relative to S&P 500 is that it's illusory correlation. They point to 2000 and they say, oh, it's making a higher high or it's up there where it was in 2000, well, those are just two separate situations. So, however, what here would make what, what, what here would make you scratch your head, Ryan, and go, hey, you know what? Maybe we, maybe we move to underweight. Mm-hmm. Honestly, on these, I kind of, well, my minimum goes up. We talked about it. There's two things that I really, we, my, our team really focuses on probably more than anything. It's what are the credits, credit markets up to, right? Credit spreads, triple B spreads, investment grade corporate spreads. If there's a monster under the bed, we're going to see stress in credit markets way before we probably see it anywhere else. We're, Spoiler alert, we're not really seeing, they, they've ticked up a little bit in the last two weeks, but we're not seeing any major stress there. And then I also like to look at advanced decline lines, and we can get into this, some of this stuff because I think it's interesting. Various advanced decline lines three to four weeks ago made a bunch of new all-time highs. They've obviously been kind of breaking down as li- literally the only thing going up has been technology. I mean, last week, tech was up 6%. Real estate was up 1%. Every other sector was down. If you look at the S P 500, only 99 stocks outperformed uh, last week, okay, even though the S&P gained 1.6%. So you've got this area where just near term, just very near term, you would only have a couple, you know, I'd say a couple, but, but not a ton of leadership going on. So if I see advanced decline lines breaking down and um, um, credit spread starting to blow out and, and, and in, increase a little bit, that would worry me. I mean, we're overweight equities now. Maybe that would be the first step to downgrade to more even weight equities. Um, but we're not there yet, Phil. So those are two things that at the end of the day, if you said what two things that you focus on, I'd focus on those two things. JC, you know, I, I, I mean, I agree with all of that. Credit spreads for sure. Um, you know, market internals and things like that. Most definitely, I would say in a more in a more immediate, uh, in, in more immediately, I would have to be able to pinpoint a group of stocks that would be the leaders to the downside in that bear market. Like, I would need to point to. You know, like in, in 2000 and, and 21, all those ARC names and biotechnology and the Chinese Internet, they all peaked in early 21. And those were, you know, those were the the the, 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 the companies that dragged down the rest of the market. You saw that in, in the great financial crisis, with home builders and financials. You had that group 
right? In the tech bubble, you had technology. Like, so who are the leaders uh, for, to the downside, really, right? So consumer discretionary has been, you know, one of the worst performers, uh, uh, even on an equally weighted basis. You know, the bifurcation between the winners and the losers, the dispersion amongst consumer discretionary has been strong there as well. So perhaps seeing monster breakdowns in consumer discretionary and massive tops could potentially be that. But we're actually betting the opposite, that money's rotating into consumer discretionaries and it's a place that we want to be in. So even in the groups that we think could potentially be uh, those culprits, uh, if you will, I know Ari Wald likes to call them that. We should have Ari on the show, by the way. Um, Ari calls them that. Like, who would they be? That does. There is no group that's dragging down this market right now. You've got underperformers, but you don't have like absolute losers that other, uh, you know, maybe the Dow transports. But again, I think we rotate into those transportation stocks. So even in some of the worst areas, I think there's opportunity, actually. And, you know, just as of Friday, down. as of Friday, so again, um, year to date. There's 11 sectors, right? 10 of them were up year to date. Okay. Now consumer discretionary, barely, barely um, real estate down. So, you know, you hear all over social media about this lack of breath we're seeing recently. And it, 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 there's some truth to it. Uh, we were hearing that also in late January. We were hearing a lot in late January about a lack of breath. And there was, again, some, some areas that struggled, but you know, that, that um, it, it almost like the internals caught up with, with overall price and given everybody all of a sudden is a technician and an expert on breath all of a sudden, um, it makes me wonder if we just play catch up, uh, catch up once again with some of the internals. It, it started so far this week. We'll see. I know it's only one or two days, but so far we're starting to see that. Yeah, because sector rotation is the lifeblood of a bull market. And while some parts of last year were thinner than others, markets kept rotating. You know, at the beginning of the year, it was all tech and growth and the best first six months in the history of the NASDAQ. Guess what? Those stocks were not working in the back half of 22 when industrials and discretionary and other areas were working across the market. Those weren't. So they got rotated into. And in the fourth quarter, you saw further rotation into other areas that were not participating. So if now you start to see that rotation back into industrials, back into financials, back into consumer discretionary, that's that breath expansion that we're talking about. But it's more sector rotation than anything else, which I think is part of the same conversation that gets lost in it. It's all about breath, breath, breath. And they're forgetting about the rotation happening underneath the surface. Feel me on that, Ryan? No, I, I to totally, totally agree there. I mean, like I said, if you look at the groups we like, we're overweight industrials and financials. And again, if I can use the F word for a second, fundamentals. Um, over the last 20 years, you look at like PE multiples uh, with using a, a Z score. Keep this fairly simple. Financials are really cheap right now. Okay. Industrials are fairly cheap right now. You know what's expensive? Tech, communication services. Not a surprise. And you don't blindly invest just on fundamentals. And I know this is a show about trends. I get it. But again, if you if you kind of like financials and industrials, those are some areas that are actually cheap right now. And again, if the other things line up, that to us suggests those are areas uh, that again, maybe the second half of this year, uh, take back the baton a little bit. That's what we're that's what we're banking on that way. Yeah, we, we were talking here, Ryan. It was one of my the gold gold the three G's gold yeah. Goldman and and Google. Goldman is so cheap in the sense that they spent fifteen years chasing tech and fintech and trying to be everything. Neo bank uh, lender, Apple. I think they're they're running with Apple as. As there are going to be more run-ins, you know, the, the fintechs are going to run into Apple. You look at PayPal. Like, there's a lot of non-momentum in this market because the big guys continue to suck momentum away. The reason momentum is working in big cap is your the, your profits are their planet's profits, right? Like, so Apple announcing, you know, um, its deal with um, a firm sucks more of the life out of PayPal and Square. Right. While they may seem big and people may love their product and toast, Apple's coming for it all in the banking sector. But who can't they come for? For sure as hell, Google, Google and Goldman can't play with Apple. They didn't make any money off that relationship. But you know what Apple can't do? What Goldman does, capital markets. Um, and when as Goldman gets back to being a capital markets player, the chart looks great. Momentum looks great. I'm buying the dips, selling the rips type thing. Uh, we were talking about here in the high threes, but like it has a tremendous amount of momentum. And I consider that a financial interactive broker. So financials are working. I agree. All right, Phil, what else? Yes. Yeah, so um, we're going to take a look at JC's chart. We were talking about industrials versus consumer discretionary here. 
And the th- the only comment I have on this discussion um, is the the art to momentum and re- regression. So you guys, we're talking about both momentum and regression trading at the same time. We're talking about okay, we're trending. We have all this momentum. It's incredible that 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 ETF is making an all time high. But at the same time, you're looking at underperformers for them, uh, for signs that they're catching up, which I just love that. So there's really a lot more, it's really, uh, really a lot more uh, 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 nuance there than just, okay, you know, get on the mag seven train. Yeah. And I think, you know, understanding the absolute trends is really important too, because when they're all, when you're always comparing something to the S and P 500, remember there aren't any tech stocks in the industrial sector. There aren't any tech stocks in the energy sector, right? So if you're comparing it to the S&P 500 that's loaded with tech stocks and tech is an outperformer, of course, those are going to underperform. It doesn't mean that it's bearish though, right? It's just, it's hard to keep up with the leaders if those are very, very strong leaders. Um, So looking at things on both an absolute and relative basis, I think makes sense. And then also when you go through these cycles enough times like we have, obviously, you'll notice that in every single one of those, you get sector rotation. That's that's how markets work. So why should we expect anything different this bull market? Like this is a perfect example. So here you're looking at the Dow Jones Industrial Average making new highs and, and the transports diverging for quite some time now. And, you know, when you study market tops throughout history, you see this sort of thing. So, of course, it calls into question, you know, the, what are the transports telling us? Well, maybe it's not. What are transports telling us? Maybe it's what is the Dow Industrial Average telling us, right? And the transports will be playing catch up. So, you know, I think it's important to play devil's advocate and think of it from both ways. So what if we do get that rotation into uh, transports um, and and confirm what the industrials have already been telling us? The way I learned it, right, Ryan, a mutual friend of ours, uh, Ralph Akampore, he said, JC, don't fight Papa Dow. And, and you know what I used to do a lot when I was little? I used to fight Papa Dow. I used to think I was so cool because the, the S&P 500 and the institutions follow. Don't fight Papa Dow. He was right all along. Yeah, I'll, I'll just jump in on that. So just, you know, I, I, we've got data on the Dow going back to 1896, right? Long time, long times. And I took a look at when the Dow makes new all-time highs because we, we can talk about leading indicators. We can talk about ISMs. We can talk about yield curves. We can talk about all these different things. We've been t- told by all those bowtie economists for two years why there's a recession coming and a bear market coming and it hadn't happened. But when the Dow hits an all-time high, again, this is back to 1900, you know, like a year later, you go into recession like less than 1% of the time. I mean, the best indicator we have for the stock market, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, for the economy, my personal opinion is likely the stock market. And I don't know if that's a self-fulfilling prophecy or not, but I mean, you know, the fact that we're still flirting with all-time no, highs. It's a, it's a thir- mechanism, yeah, I mean, we've made 31 right? all-time highs on the S&P, assuming we close higher today. Let's call it 30 for the year, whatever. Um, you know, that tends to be one of the better signs that we have. I mean, I'll never forget two years ago right now, May of 20, or four years ago, sorry, uh, May of 2020, right? Stocks, ri- or April, April and May, stocks ripped higher, right? In the middle of COVID, some of the worst headlines we've ever seen. If the market was going higher, everybody's scratching their head, why? Because, well, maybe the market saw, maybe things weren't going to be as bad as we thought. Maybe the Fed was going to flood the month, flood the system. Whatever it was, the market saw that. So the market is smarter than all of us. And new highs tend to be a signal that the economy is not going into recession in the next 12 months. Um, just put it like that. One thing we should all get used to is no matter what the economy is doing, the headlines will get worse. I mean, we all, it's the TikTok generation. Um Ad dollars spent on TV are going this way. Ad dollars spent on influence are going this way. That does not lead to, you know, what are influencers going to do to get ad dollars? They're going to say whatever the, they're not professionals. They're going to say whatever it's, whether they believe it or not. What are, as ad dollars flow out of television, what are the remaining TV people doing? We see what they've been doing. They've been polarizing further and further and trying to steal users from each other with more polarizing figures. So everybody, you know, I call this everybody's Tucker Carlson. And if everybody's Tucker Carlson, there will be a recession every day, according to somebody. The truth of the matter is the economy is so big. um, And uh, there's so much cash, as Phil showed on the sidelines, that there's just rolling, you know, there's rolling recessions, basically. What what we viewed as a recession before is different because our kids have Venmo. 
the, uh, lucky enough, some parents can just you've got the boomerang kid. So it's much harder to read the economy, which could just be another reason why people are trend following. Um, so again, these all are so interrelated, but you know, really good thoughts from you guys. All right, Bill, what else? As a next? corollary to that, you know, don't trust what you read. Like you, there's nothing trustable now. Like why that, read? Why read it all? Talk to your friends. The beautiful Talk thing about friends. the beautiful thing uh, about what 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 Brian and JC both do is they just look at data and they really don't derive that much. It's just pure what it is. It's like what what Ryan just said. Hey, the Dow Jones Industrial Average makes a new all-time high and a year later histor by historic standards were 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 higher or and we're not in a recession. And it's just simple math. It's just looking back at history, seeing the is it 100%? No. But it's just simple over and over and over again. So then you turn on the TV or you go on Twitter and you just see people saying insane shit. Everybody's Tucker Carlson. It's a great line, Howard. And it's like, there's nothing, you know, there's nothing there of value whatsoever. Um, ultimately, I think- I will, I will, I will say, dude, I and mean, then there's fans of Tucker Carlson that call me all the time and say, watch it. And I, and I did somehow. He had on the quarterback for the Green Bay. What's his name? Who's insane. Um, oh, my God. Who's now an expert on foreign affairs, too. The old Aaron Rodgers. And he's the quarterback the for the uh, Jets. Uh, Howard. Whatever. <laughs> Still green. Okay. Oh. I had to hear. Tucker Carlson had. You know, you know be prepared for. I saw three minutes of it that I can't dude, unsee. The dude got traded oh to the God. Jets and broke his leg on the first fucking play. <laughs> oh, and, and, it's classic. and no wonder he thinks that the government is going to put chips in our fucked heads. Up. So, up, anyways, Bill. it's or, so. I mean, the yeah, fact I, that world affairs are being talked about on Tucker Carlson and that guy, and that. This guy who has every privilege in the world thinks that America is coming to an end. Or get used to this. These are people that are not momentum investing. These are people that are telling you that grocery stores in Russia are better than your local store. And literally, he said yesterday, in a few years, we're going to have social credit scores here. And you're not going to be able to shop at the supermarket you want unless you're a good person. These are things coming out of the mouths of 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 leading uh, voices in 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 so uh, prepare for the headlines to get worse that's the only thing i know in my soul is to try and shrink my world down to people and prices uh that will keep me not insane so and to be fair could, there's they, idiots this and liars is part of the explanation sides. and to be fair I, I wasn't saying aside there i was right. just pointing out two idiots that I ran across, and we know Tucker Carlson, he sold his soul. Uh, but, you know, uh, he's entitled to have whatever guest he wants on. But to hear the nonsense spewing out of these people in a world where we have all this uh, opportunity is crazy. Okay, crazy. so we're going to go back to uh, one other regression potential uh, play rather than momentum potential play. Ryan, I'm going to hit you with this. You recently came out bullish of small caps, which I hear nobody else saying at all, anywhere. And so it's, I think, well worth our time to let you walk us through uh, how you're looking at that. Yeah, we have uh, we like small and mid caps. Uh, you know, for the year, small caps are flat, mid caps up 6 7%, S&Ps about double that. Um, now, believe me, <laughs> small caps have struggled. It's frustrated a lot of people. Uh, the last two months last year, the Russell 2000, with JC was talking about that big fourth quarter with the rotation. The Russell 2000 was up about 24% in two months, November, December last year. That was like the best two-month rally ever. I took a look at the 10 biggest two-month rallies ever for the Russell 2 a year later. Higher, like 20-something percent on average, and higher like every single time. So, again, maybe we're consolidating after a record two-month rally in small caps. But a little more color on this. You talk about small caps, people hate them. 
rightfully so they've struggled we get it um you know but it's you know if everybody's thinking alike somebody isn't thinking general Patton, maybe there's an opportunity there and to us at carson group we look at the inflation data and you don't go off the wheels a little bit for trends and friends but I, there's actually a trends in inflation that people aren't talking about groceries are down four months in a row new car prices down five months in a row um you know if you look at cpi restaurant yeah restaurants have come back restaurants are like three and a half percent year over year that's where they were in 2019 i don't want to get too in the weeds in this but sonu and i do a lot of this stuff there are signs under the surface that yes core cpi has been stubborn at 3.3 3.4 for a long time under the surface there are signs there there's some big improvement coming what in the world does that mean to us well this is why we added uh, again we're more uh, we're still underweight underweight fixed income but we switched around our duration we got out of some high yield which did really well on that side and added some treasuries about a month and a half two months ago because we saw some signs that said you know what inflation is going to improve here what does that mean big deal inflation improves. what's it mean to the market what's it mean to people trying to invest money it means likely we're going to see lower yields we think yields are peak for the year we've seen yields start to go lower uh 435 is a big level for the 10 year, we're beneath that. Uh, two year yield obviously has been going lower, so shorter in. So the market's bu- not buying the Fed's bluff, where the Fed came off hawkish saying they're going to cut only one time. Market didn't buy that. We don't buy that. We think there's probably two cuts coming. And again, yields go lower. And what in the world does all that mean? Well, potentially that can be a potential driver for just more dispersion, more, more uh, broad participation, specifically small caps and mid caps. And I mentioned last comment on this I mentioned we look at 20 years out, two standard deviations. What's going on with valuations? Well, small caps rolled into large caps. Small caps are the cheapest they've been since 1999. Okay. Um, that led to a 13 year period of outperformance. I'm not saying we're going to have a 13 year period of outperformance, but I'm saying that there's a lot of kindling there. If we get any positive news, and again, I think it's going to be one more solid inflation print, which we are expecting, that can be a rotation into small and mid the second half of this year that a lot of people are not expecting. Um, but that could just be in the next phase of this uh, overall structural bull market we think we're in. Mm-hmm. JC? Beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. Listen, I think that if we've learned anything about the stock market is that the bond market, the the stock market just doesn't want bond market volatility, you know, so the range bound kind of lackluster environment that we've been in um, has been a tailwind for equities. I think can continue to be, you know, if, if rates have peaked for the year, as long as they're not completely collapsing and we're not getting this monster flight to safety in, in treasury bonds, you know, with, with real rate of acceleration there. You know, I think stocks would find it favor, you know, it'd be more favorable if things would just stay messy and range bound in the rate market. I'll add to the, you know, what uh, Dietrich was saying about lower rates. Uh, you've got Canada, uh, mm-hmm. right? Uh, they they lowered rates. ECB, Euro, did. Europe, ECB for the first well. time since 2019 cut rates recently. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So things are happening globally. I guess we'll see what happens. Um, you know, again, it. it if you're looking for that rotation, whether it be in financials or industrials or consumer discretionaries, you know, an interest rate market that's muted and not really doing, not really having these massive swings and 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 strong directional moves, you know, I think I think that's good for that rotation. I could see, you know, lackluster rates, small caps really doing well. And by the way, zoom out in the chart of the Russell 2000. Yeah. It goes from the lower left to the upper right, guys. Right. Long term uptrend. Mm-hmm. Yeah, can I add? Can I add a few thoughts? So I know I sent around just around the private markets too, because we we we, were, we do like talking about momentum. I shared it with you and Kiki a few minutes ago. We but threw that in there. About- it's in the doc. First okay, time fundraising activity, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's talk about what America's phenomenal. So again, I think we're like I said. There's I've never seen things more clear. It doesn't make think that my returns will be better, but I've never seen things more clear. We have. We've talked about it here. We have a luxury economy, degenerate economy. Hate it, like it. I, I, I'm just telling you what I see. We, we, we had a bubble to end all bubbles. Worse than 1999. It just happened in the private markets. Your, 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 your mom and dad didn't see it. Um, if you look at this chart, I'm in this space. I'm embarrassed for what I saw. And I wrote about it from 2017 to 2021 with SoftBank and the SoftBank copiers. It, you know, history will go back and maybe they'll rewrite history and say Tiger was trying to corner the market and be create, be the S&P ETF of private markets. It didn't work. And from that, you see the chart here, right? You had this blistering 
you know, the 2020 dip because of COVID and then people realized they weren't going to die. The money printer went on. Everybody became a VC right at the top in 2021. Unlike learning how to trade, the misdirection of those private markets, which I love, is incredible. All those people from 2014 to 2021 did not learn one thing about investing. They were fake investing. They were taking LP money, putting it in long-term deals under the auspices of ZERP, not understanding one thing about the market. In 1999 to 2000, we all learned how to what a stop loss was, what uh, asset allocation was. So we have a generation of people that don't even know what the stock market is. And now they're going to be working for free because you can see that dip there from 21 to 24. Those people can't get out. They're working for free still, despite them allocating money right at the top. You can't just sell. You're dealing with shit. Um, so, so what I have seen clearly is 2024 to late last year, when we were writing a lot of checks and Ryan seen in the wealth tech, he's seen a couple of our products. There's never been a better time to write seed stage checks. So there's never been a better time to be a momentum investor. There's never been a better time to be out of certain parts of momentum. And there's never been a better time to build a business because no one's watching. Right. If you stay at the eye line of sight of Apple, Google, you know, if you come in with the idea, I'm going to upset those people, you're thinking about it wrong. If you come in in the way where I'm going to think about building a business organically with the tech that I have at my service that that last bubble gave us, there is so much opportunity right now. But I will tell people, get Stop reading headlines. Get yourself off TikTok, at least on the mobile apps. Get yourself off headlines and start following people that look at price and look at correlations. And I think I said this before, Ryan, CMT is the new CFA. You know, even as even as I joke about like, of course, fine, fundamental analysis matters. Um, but what matters more is how price action works and how intermarket works. So I think the CMT is poorly run as an organization as it may be. That that JC's had one forever, and I think I think that's the first time I heard that acronym. CMT is is an incredible like an, you know thing to learn. So I've had my CMT for twenty years. I got mine in two thousand four. I believe I was the four hundred ninety ninth person to get one. And you know I was like, do I want to get a CFA? Do I want to go CMT? Worked at an option shop, short term trading, using sentiment things like oh. It made more sense for me to get a CMT, and and I'm thankful. Now, I will be honest or, or, or clear about this. It, it sometimes was not always great for my career not to have a CFA, not to think like everybody else, not to always look up balance sheets and PE multiples and earnings, but to actually look at price momentum and seasonality and sentiment and all those things that I look at now. And thank God that's how I look at it because I don't look at the world like your average market strategist that's on TV talking about these things. I look at, uh, hopefully, a whole different spectrum, and I'm with you totally, Howard, that um, you know when you're managing money, <laughs> There's a lot of ways to do it, um, but I, I absolutely think we're just looking at relative strength and certain things really can help you um, if you're if ignoring it, you're just behind the eight ball. Yeah, because a lot of these forms of analysis, I'll, I'll just chime in quickly, the, the, a lot of these forms of analysis are about what the market should be doing, what the market could be doing, when technical analysis focuses on what the market is actually doing. Yeah. Anyways, I, a little tip there for people, a roundabout way that if I can do it, anybody can do it, I have a, I tr I've tried every form of investing, but intermarket analysis and really taking a step back, really cherry picking who you follow, understanding your own behavior. Um, the four of us around the table have these conversations, which are never going to be viral, but are very helpful to me. Um, you know, looking at the intermarket, like I see at private markets, right? It's, you know, as confused as I am about this momentum, I'm not going to fight it. But as confused as I am about the private markets, it's still never been a better time. A lot of it just has to do is how you attack these, these, these things. And for people that don't know what a CMT is, look it up. You know, we've been saying this for a very long time. Um, you know, think about doing that. That'll make you a better investor, and it'll make you obviously more interesting at cocktail parties than a CFA. So it has everything going for it. Um, and I didn't know it had been around that long. So kudos to you. And do you feel like 
you missing something by not looking at fundamentals? What, well, let me put it this way. I, the, um, the no, I don't think I'm missing much because I work with a guy named Suno Varghese who lives in the data, lives in the macro world. He puts together incredible notes and things. It gives me enough bullet points to be aware if I'm on TV with Centola yesterday. I got to talk about whatever you know macro things out there. Trust me, end of the day. I think momentum and technicals matter a little bit more than fundamentals, just what I think. But again, I, I'm pretty well versed in the fundamental world if I have to be. And I do find it interesting. I mean, I never thought I liked talking about the Fed or inflation or some of that stuff, honestly, 15, 20 years ago. But it is pretty interesting. And some of it does all kind of um, come together. And into the day of market strategist like me, I'm not a pure technician, right? I'm a market strategist. I have to tell stories. I tell stories. And my job is to take the complex data, make it easy for people to understand. I present all over the country. Last week, I was in California for a few days. Then I was in New York. York City for a few days. I mean, I'm all over the place. And the best advice, or no, the best compliment I get is when a little old lady comes up at the end of my conversation, my presentation, whatever, and says, you know what? I have no idea what you just said, but I really liked it. <laughs> you know, that's what I'm trying to do is tell stories and help people understand what's happening out there. I'm not always going to be right and I always going to be wrong, but I'm using data to show where we were. Just a quick example. I want to make sure this gets out there. We had a good May, okay? S&P gained over 4% in May. What in the world does that mean? Usually May is not that strong. The rest of the year is normally higher and up an average of 10%, a median of 13%. That's way better than average. It's just one data point. I get it. But when I stack all these different data points on top of each other, and I share them all over the place for free, honestly, a lot of times, um, they continue to suggest that this upward trend we've been in is still alive and well, guys. You can go to uh, Google and just uh, Google Dietrich Carson Group blog and subscribe to that because you get so much. And Ryan, you just mentioned inflation. I know we were talking about it earlier. I do want to cover a little bit more if you guys have a few more minutes because the other call that you uh, made recently is a really important one. I know we were talking about the volatility of rates before and I agree with you guys. It's super important. It's like, what's the, you know, how, how fast are we moving in one direction or another? And if we're just kind of meandering within a range, you know, to, to JC's point, we don't care as much. It's a, it's a little bit more benign because there's nothing, you know, there's no unexpected event. But you made a call uh, last week, I think. When was that article? I think it was, la- yeah, it was, it was, it was the 13th. Um, what, did I, what did I say? I can't wait to hear what I said. Inflation, <laughs> inflation is headed lower. Mm-hmm. And that means rate cuts are coming. Mm -hmm. And so the thing that I love about that is it's declarative because Mm -hmm. if you turn on, to to Howard's point, you turn on the TV, you go on the internet, and depending on what happened that morning or what the latest uh, date one data point was, people are freaking out in one direction, oh my God, it's inflation, or in the other direction, oh my God, it's gonna be a recession. And it's like, all you have to do is flip a coin. But you're making a call and you're not a coin flipper guy. Mm-hmm. So why don't you just tell us a yeah. little bit about this uh, uh, lower inflation call sure. based on data. So at the start of the year, we we're hearing six or seven cuts. We always said, wow, if we have six or seven cuts this year. That probably means the economy is really slowing down. We weren't seeing a s- signal the economy is majorly going to slow down. And then about two months ago, we're actually hearing people talk about rate hikes, rate hikes. There's going to be no cuts, rate hikes. We said, well, that's the pendulum had swung way too far. And that's why, again, in some of the models we run, we've moved a little bit of high yield into treasuries. For the first time in two years I've been here, we've never touched treasuries. We just thought that pendulum pendulum fill swung way too far. And now we're starting to see some better inflation data. And again, the big and that's why treasuries literally had their best week of the year last week and bonds, the, the ag, your average bond fund was down about four or five percent. Not that long ago, the ag's up on the year now. I'm not bragging about being up on the year when we know stocks have done a lot better. But hey, at least you're getting something out of bonds here all, all of a sudden. But I'll put it like this. The worry that we hear is if the Fed starts to cut, and let's be clear, the Fed hasn't had the best record when it comes to inflation. Remember, transitory, transitory, transitory transitory behind the eight ball. If they cut, maybe inflation source. Now I'll make this quick. We are, we think one of the big, oh, here's a new trend. Here's another trend we haven't talked about. We think there's a major trend in productivity in our country. If you look productivity, like the last two decades, average like 1.5%. What in the world does that mean? That's really low. The last couple quarters were up around 3%. This is something Sony's talked a lot about. We think we're on the, the precipice of a lot of positives on productivity. Why is that? Because everybody got a new job two years ago. I'm a perfect example of this. Everybody got a new job. They're actually staying in their jobs. They're happy where they are. So people are being more productive. There's some other things going on that are leading productivity, AI and these things. If we're on 
a, a cusp of maybe five years or so of stronger productivity than we just saw last decade. What does that mean? The last time we had strong productivity like this was in the mid 90s. The mid 90s, what happened? Alan Greenspan cut a little bit in 95. We had strong productivity. We didn't have a soaring inflation after they did some surgical cuts. And all what also happened? Well, gee. Remember what happened? (laughs) We saw higher wages put a prior productivity puts a cap on inflation with those higher wages. The economy continued to grow mid to late 90s, really strong. um, And the economy did well or stock market did well. One final thing. If usually uh, GDP comes in a little bit lower than what they thought at the start of the year, that's just how it works, except in periods when you have stronger productivity. Mid to late 90s, every time it started the year, GDP was whatever number it was. It came in higher like every time. Last year, nominal GDP in the U.S. was over 6%. Okay. That's more than China. Nobody thought our economy was going to grow like that, including us. We were kind of bullish. We didn't think it'd grow like that, but because we had stronger productivity, what I'm saying, a cherry on top, a trend for friends here. If we continue to see better productivity numbers going forward, that's a really good sign. It lets the fed cut a couple of times. Economy is still strong. Wages can remain strong. And there's a lid on inflation. Howie. Okay. I'll give you, I mean, just four productive guys here, but let me give you a little personal story. It, it's the opposite of what what Ryan said, because Ryan, Ryan's talking about actual numbers because he's done the work. Use your eyes and ears. We've never been in, in, in it's a two prong thing. Like we've never been in a higher productive market and a lower productive market. I look at my daughter who loves to work, loves her job, got screwed in her COVID years because she wanted to be productive. But guess what? Working from home, no mentorship. Uh, overpaid because the companies make money. They don't know how to track these kids. These kids are watching Netflix, right? So there's this lost productivity. We're not even counting the lost productivity of these, of these first entrants into the job market that aren't getting proper mentoring like you did. Um, they're not getting doors slammed in their face. They're not, they don't even know what to do. Okay. But then there's the other side of the world, the six year old. I was supposed to be retired. I have coffee. I have Adderall. I have weights. I have. Uh, fitness. I have uh, lifestyle. I have knowledge. Um, I can work four jobs. Elon Musk is running four multi hundred million. We joke about him. I like to joke. I'm mean, an angry prick, but he's there's nobody in human history that's been able to do this. So again, it depends who you look at. You've never had a better opportunity to be more productive. You've also had a, never had a better opportunity to look at the wrong news, follow the wrong people, and be the most miserable, unproductive human being on earth. We're seeing it in America. We're seeing it in parts of the Middle East. Um, so again, it, a lot of this comes down to your own personal attitude and your choice. You can go to Instagram and be miserable. You can go to Instagram and follow comedians. You can go to Instagram and follow um, fitness. And you can go to Instagram and follow, you know, lifestyle, right? Improving your life. So you can train the algo to do what you want it to do. I just think most people are not picking the right mentors and training the goals. So the productive the productivity part is is really important because it's up to it's never been a better time to be an investor and therefore you have to f- align yourself with product productive people, productive thinkers and productive assets. And it, this is the best time of all time to do that. So that's the interesting thing about this market. Go ahead, Phil. We're all out of time. uh, We're not going to get to like five things, but Ryan D, (laughs) love you, bro. Literally. Old school. Great job. Last word. What do you... Last word. Um, thank you guys. I'm sitting here because, you know, Phil, you reached out many years ago. Howard, you've helped me a lot. Um, you know, we're, we're always connected. I'm always here if you need me. But just thank Love you to you, you guys for everything you've done for my career to make this. Howard, I'm the reason I'm a media whore because you, you got me out there. Now it's your problem. You did this. You created it, Howard. I'm like Frankenstein. You can't turn me off now. I'm everywhere. But honestly, uh, you know, lo- love what you guys are doing. Love this new podcast. Uh, honored to be here. And um, I don't know. Just yeah. Just thanks for everything, guys. Yeah, the podcast is it fun, is. right? Yes. Like it's fun to just to just let our friends yep. speak. The uh, you're very good at the media, John. I mean, I was I was, I was mentioning about Josh last, and I'm watching who that he's just so savvy at this. Um, I'm not savvy at media. I just don't like. Um, but the way you've evolved and be able to like you and JC especially, Phil. We didn't get to health corner, Phil. One tip. Oh, one quick tip. So here's the thing. It's the longest days of the year right now. And it's very hot, especially in the Northeast. So what you do for the next two weeks, get out early. 
Go for an early hike. There's no time more gorgeous and beautiful in the day than sunrise or just after sunrise. So get out there. Go to bed early tonight. Get yourself up 5, 5.30 in the morning. Find a friend. Find a dog. Find anybody. And just get outside and move your body. Go for a hike if there's a place. If there's a park within a couple miles of where you live. Go to the park. Get out there early. Go for a little hike early, early in the morning. The beauty of it is, is that you get your exercise in for the day. You're back by 7.30. You take a shower. You're ready to go before the market open. It's beautiful. Get out there early, early in the morning for the next two or three weeks, especially while it's hot and especially while the days are longer than 15 hours. Yeah. All right, boys. Ryan, you look a little bit thinner too. I think. I think I, I noticed that you're. Uh, are you walking? I'm trying to. I don't know. I was in California last week. Ate too much food last week, but I'm. I'm trying to. Yeah. Uh, one yeah. week's fine. All right, boys. We'll do it again. Phil, thanks for running this. Ryan, thanks for uh, joining Thank you. us. Adios. See you guys. Thank you.